All right, welcome to Crimson Guitars and welcome to a... Well, I'm obviously patently and certainly not in my workshop right now. I am outside an auction house. Uh, my mother sent me a message two days ago and said, Ben, metaphorically and digitally slapping me, why did you not know that this auction was in existence? And uh, there is a single owner collection of guitars going up to auction on Wednesday in a couple of days. And there are some very, very sweet things in there. And you've seen the title. There's a 59 Les Paul. There's a, a, an early 50s Les Paul Goldsop. There's some beautiful strats. And uh, we're not actually going to get to take them apart too much. But we're going to have a look. Burn it. I'm having fun. Hey, yeah. This, this is going to be fun. Mark, are you a pig in the proverbial at the moment? Oh my God, I, I cannot, I cannot tell you. I mean, it's been an amazing experience um, to beat all experiences, I have to say. You know, I'm a kind of uh, a general auctioneer, really. Um, You're a general auctioneer. Uh, but with a, with a leaning towards guitars, I've always collected guitars myself. I love them, but I have to tell you, I never ever thought I would get to deal with a, a real 59. And so this has been a journey, not only because I'm dealing with one of the most iconic guitars in the world, but actually it's been a very personal and emotive trip too, yeah. because this guitar belonged to a gentleman called James Morgan. Sadly, I never got to meet him. I wish I had. Yeah. I've got involved in not just a piece of wood, not just a guitar. I got involved in someone's life. Absolutely. Um, and that life, and we all know that guitars are imbued with part of their, 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 owner, yes. their owner's um, uh, you know, character, um, ability to play, whatever it is. It's hard to describe, really, isn't it? There's, there's a yeah. history of guitars, and yeah. I, you know, I'm a, uh, obviously tools and making mm. and creating. Yeah. Yeah. I've got chisels that are you know, 250, 300 years old yeah. that I use. Yeah, absolutely. And they've got that history. Obviously, James Morgan was the player, and this is a player grey guitar. And yeah. this whole collection that we're going to have a quick look at are his instruments, and it's a one collection auction, which I think is amazing. Yes, you could yes. lose something like yeah. this in a bigger auction and a more standard yeah. guitar auction. And I think that's what really appealed to me about dealing with this collection. Um, I wanted to do a really good job for James. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they could have been part of a much, much bigger sale, but I think keeping the personality of just his collection together, not just his guitars, but the equipment that came from his studio. Yeah. You know, he had his little studio in Wandsworth in the 1970s. He bought the, uh, the the Gibson in about 72, 73. Okay. Um, he paid about 450 pounds for it. So the, so the family, so the family says, yeah, yeah, it was a lot of money then. I think it, you know, probably the equivalent of three and a half, four thousand pounds a day. And okay. when you look at that in spending power terms, it yep. was a lot of money. Yeah. His little studio uh, picked up. He he basically was starting to get in people. Initially, a four track uh, yeah. like Arthur Brown, yeah. uh, the Pretty Things, uh, and that evolved into the punk era as well. Yeah. He was getting you know New Model Army. Glenn Matlock was in there, so he was having experiences. He was playing in bands. Yeah, he was a generous man. Apparently, he let other people play his fifty nine. He let them play it in the studio. Yeah. But he guarded it too. He slept with it under its bed. Under his bed. Yeah. That's what I love about dealing with this, this collection as, as it is. It's his collection and that makes yeah. it more important to me. I want to do the best for the family uh, and the best for him. The value of something like this becomes a burden to its owner yeah. in a way. It's something he wanted to play um, and he did play all, all of his life. In fact, you know, his famous words were apparently that his cold dead fingers would have to be, to be <laughs> prized off of the fretboard. But you know, it, it, it is a player's guitar and we know um, obviously it was um, it was fitted with a big speed so it's got that snake bite, it's got other Changes. So that, it's one of Clapton's first Les Pauls had a big spear as well, didn't it? Yeah. Well, the thing is, you know, there's the co of, obviously yes. Keith Richards yeah. this was was big spear, but you know, basically, was it factory fitted? Was it not? We're not absolutely sure. It could have been. In fact, mm -hmm. um, it's got those kind of modifications. I mean, the bridge and the tail are probably off of an early '60s Gibson. Okay. Uh, it's got refinishing on the lacquer and things. It's got replacement machine heads, uh, but all of those are the kind of things you expect from a player's guitar 
that's 50 years old that's been used yeah. and adored in, in a way. Yeah. Um, you, you, the first thing you do is whack those coussons out. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. Before they fall off, <laughs> you know, <laughs> literally, yeah. literally. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's, that's what I'm kind of trying to get out of this guitar, that love, really, that, that, that James had for it. Now, of course, in these times, it equates to a large amount of money. Um, yeah. And yet, you know, um, when I first picked up this guitar and some of the other guitars as well that are around us, I kind of didn't know what to expect of it. I'm a bass player, yeah. um, and so I'm used to kind of having to work a bit harder. Yeah. Um, and I got this back home, and of course, the first thing I wanted to do with it was plug it in and have of a course. go. And I was Our just... Our are being incredibly generous. <laughs> yeah, and, was... <laughs> and to be frank, I was just completely uh, bowled over by the, the grace of it, the yeah. easiness of it, the, the texture of it. And I was kind of... It was almost too easy, um, in a way, if that makes sense. No, I understand. Um, it was set up by a luthier called Graham Noden, who was a great friend of, uh, of James's. He's dead um, in the streets and uh, yeah, still going. It's still going, yeah. Um, and Graham, I've spoken to Graham at length about this guitar and the other guitars as well, which has given it that fabulous kind of seamless 50 year timeline in essence. Yeah. You know, we know everything about it that is is kind of, is kosher and, and, and right. Um, and in fact, actually, Graham Noden, the luthier, this was his first paying job. <laughs> he refretted this out of college in 1973. That's part of its history. And they struck up an amazing relationship uh, between them. And actually, uh, Graham made two guitars for, uh, for James and uh, James left them back to Graham in his will, okay. in fact. Um, and uh, one of the guitars that Graham made for him was almost a perfect replica of this, in fact. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, I played it and I just thought, oh my God, this is every bit as good as it's cracked up to be. Every bit as good. There's a, there's a, there's a feeling that you get and some people don't understand it, but, and it's not necessarily the sum of its parts. It's not, hey, mm. this is a guitar and it's well set up and all that jazz. Mm. There's this almost indefinable, the fact that it's a 59 years Paul, and mm -hmm. you know, this is an auction, we're hoping, I suppose, that uh, Mr. Bonamassa is gonna come in and bid and, and you- Who can, knows, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't know. But yeah. so financially and, and monetarily, this instrument has mm -hmm. a value, and that value has been created by the fact that it was Clapton and the Stones and mm -hmm. all of these people yeah. used this era of guitar to do stuff that we all absolutely love. Mm. Yeah. And it's not just the intrinsic, this is a bit of wood, this is some metal and some frets mm. and a setup. It's all of that history. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, Les Paul, Lester mm -hmm. Paul, first and all, and, and, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, that's something that runs through every vein of my body because, you know, running a, a guitar sale like this is, 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 is great for me. It's, it's not work. You know, I, I spent I spent over 30 years in the world of art and antiques, and of course, I'm as likely on one hand to be dealing with uh, classic cars or, or Roman pots or, or paintings or whatever. But one of my personal interests is guitar. So of course, this is a dream, dream mission, you know, uh, uh, for me to to kind of deal with this. Um, and you know, I cannot tell you how much time I have invested in this, but not just the physical kind of preparation of the catalog and the cataloging and things like that. It's with people. And that's been part of the joy of it. It's been meeting people like you. It's been, you know, uh, finding my way through parts of the guitar world that in fact I didn't even realize existed yeah. in a way. It's absolutely. Um, and it's been brilliant. It's been brilliant. And in say, yeah. we need, I need to talk about you. So you, this, you are not just an auctioneer or uh, you know uh, an art and antiques expert you are um you know an author you are on television you antiques roadshow and um all, all sorts of things in the antiques and collectibles side it's particularly interesting that you're into guitars but you're yeah. obviously comfortable on camera and well I, you know I, i'm very very lucky i'm one of those people that kind of you know i was able to kind of use my passion really uh, in other directions whether that was in in writing or whatever and uh, and getting picked up on on bbc antiques roadshow as a specialist and i've been doing that for 25 years yeah. and of course that's been a joy in itself to be part of that it's opened many doors for me over the years and i'm very grateful for all of those experiences 
experiences. So yeah, that, that in itself has been a great part of my life. Um, and of course, that also has, has helped because, you know, in a way, I, uh, you know, these things come to me uh, with that kind of sense of authority that hopefully I'm able to offer and help Absolutely. with, um, which gives people hopefully a bit more confidence in, in our ability to, to deal with, 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 um, with things. But, you know, my colleague here, Lee Young at Doran Reese, um, auctioneers, I, I work with him on Antiques Roadshow, yeah. and we, we instill that, that passion as well. You know, we feel that we can give uh, a small private collection like this um, the 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 kind of the texture the impetus uh, the the kind of passion that it needs to make it work um, exactly. and um, and you know that's 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 a, a kind of a niche uh, way of doing sales that we feel is very important in other words if anybody out there has a collection of guitars to sell like this this is where you go <laughs> uh, we are just going to walk around uh, Mark and I and do a quick this is this, this is that. And then after this, towards the end of this, what is turning into an epic video, uh, we're gonna look closely and take close-ups of each guitar, each bass, and uh, skim over some of the other bits and pieces. And it's all interesting stuff. I am sorely tempted. Tell me what we've got. Well, kind of what I loved about James, James's love of guitars, he was a bit of a Gibson man. So, you know, in the cabinets, we've got his spread of Gibson, so to speak. So over there in the distance, uh, oh, we've, got his, we've got his, his uh, single cut 56 Junior. Now, I love this guitar. And, you know, sometimes the simplest of things uh, can be the best. And I think it really kind of um, is true of this. Because, you know, we all know that these were kind of cheaper starter guitars, but what we didn't know really was that they were going to become legendary for their kind of sheer sound, their, their kind of almost coarseness, their playability, they're just the, you know, they just do what they're meant to do. And, um, you know, this, well. yeah, and this is a joy to play, this, this guitar. Um, it really is. And a um, little bit of a pullback on the... Um, on the tail of the bridge there, um, which is set up in a way that some people might not like, but it does play very well the way it is set up. Um, it's got a little bit of wear. It's got its, you know, some nice kind of buckle rash that in oh, uh, some, some point has even been someone has tried to color it back in and then it's, you know, it's come back out again. Um, but this is quite a, you know, this is a very honest, honest guitar. Um, and, um, I'm sure it'll do pretty well, actually. This has got a very nice, absolutely even kind of lateral crack, crack allure on it as well. The way it's aged is good. It's beautiful. So, well, Mark, tell me about it. Yeah, 52 gold top. Again, one of James's favorite guitars. Um, he kind of was collecting the, the, the Gibson Trinity, really, I suppose. We know it's a 52, no serial number. No serial number. No serial number, which you don't obviously don't get on the 52s, but we know it's a 52 because it's got the scars of the original trapezoid uh, tail on it. Holes in the end, couple of, of arc scratches here which shows where it's sat. So of course it's had to be modified um, uh, to take this, this bridge and tail here. Um, the gold top on it actually is in really, really nice condition. You've got that nice kind of straight uh, crack allure on it. Not too much of it, um, but actually in very good condition. They often disintegrate and yes, green. Yeah, uh, this one has survived very, very well in fact. And of course we've got the uh, probably I would say a reduced neck on it because the trouble is with the trapezoid, of course, you couldn't set them up very easily with a with this style of bridge. So getting it, the action good, the intonation good was difficult. They often get the neck skimmed, um, which I think is what's happened on this. But it's a good player's guitar again, despite the things that have kind of happened to it in its history. And it plays very nicely. It's set up very nicely. I expect that this is getting a lot of interest. It is getting a lot of interest, despite those uh, those changes um, and uh, what some would consider imperfections, those historical changes to it, it's still getting a lot of interest. People have been saying to me, don't you think it's a bit underpriced? I kind of didn't want to underprice it for auction. It's just that I was worried about those changes. What's your estimate at the moment? Uh, it's got four to 6,000 on it. Um, I mean, could you take six now? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm quite... I'm not even joking. Um, I, 
<laughs> it's it's going to go for more than that. Yeah, I think I think that. I think you're absolutely right on that. We've got a lot of other peripheral equipment, and I have to say, for a single watt, you know, reissue valve amp, I love these little Marshall anniversaries. Yeah. They they're great. We've got the SG Junior. 61 great little guitar again uh you know sound all of its own and again very powerful little thing it's a kind of well gigged guitar it's got that kind of rough and toughness about it the simplicity of it really of a of a well gigged guitar it sounds powerful it's simple um and it's got all those knocks and scrapes that you associated with a uh, with a guitar of this type as usual the scratch plate is kind of warped these were very fragile and brittle you've got the these this always happens yeah always happens yeah with these sgs but again it's a you know it's a great little player i've enjoyed um, I've enjoyed playing this. It's got those, uh, it's got its original machine heads on it, actually. They're still intact. Um, but yeah, just a kind of well-gigged example. And um, yeah, I'm sure it'll do well as well. And we've got some basses here. Yeah, these were his real kind of gigging guitars. He played these a lot. We've got a, we've got a, a, a Mike Oldfield uh, edition there. We've got, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're nice. And uh, you know, I, I, it's only recently that I've played PRSs and I have to say these are gorgeous, uh, so really gorgeous. So you're predominantly a bass player yourself. I am, yeah, yeah. That's uh, what I, I, you know, I'll play the six string, but the trouble is I play the six string like I play the bass, which is a yeah. bit kind of quirky, maybe. Yeah, um, you need to, quirky is required. Yeah, um, and, um, the thing is, these are, are rare. They didn't, they didn't for, for one reason or the other, didn't work out too well for PRS. But these um, are golden era guitars, yeah. aren't they? You know, they're, they're, the, yeah, they're, the, they're the best PRSs, really. And um, uh, yeah, gorgeous. Um, and of course, we've got his old Marshall um, uh, stacks here. So these are bass, uh, aren't they? Yeah, they're both bass. We've got a 300 and a 600 um, Jubilee um, with the flight cases. Well gigged, scrappy, but working. And actually, you know, call me a bit of an analog anarchist, but, you know, I, I'd rather have one of these stacks any day of the week. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I've, I've literally just gone digital for the first time. With a with a Kemper, let's just gloss over this old. Yeah, thing. that one's not worth talking about. We've got a few others here. We've got his old Epiphones, the Rivoli and the Riviera. James liked the Rivoli and Riviera books. They basically were kind of a matching pair, and of course they come from Kalamazoo as well. Um, but he was really into his P bass, this old 6263 Precision, um, which he actually had refinished. It was a salmon pink when he acquired it. And we all know that the legend of the salmon pink, whether you believe it or not, is another matter. Actually, James had this stripped back and found that it was a sunburst underneath, had it refinished in, in salmon pink again. It's had a couple of other additions. It's got some new chrome work on it and the tuck bar is missing off it and things, but it plays very, very nicely. Lovely patination on the neck and things. And I've, I must admit, I've spent a couple of hours playing that and I, I do love it. He was a bit of a fender man. So, you know, he's got a couple of strats here we've got a very nice 64. I have a feeling that James really bought this particular one more as an investment guitar because I don't think he ever really played it. It uh, doesn't look much. like it had the same sort of life. No, it's in very, very good condition um, and it's in its original case as well uh, and it came with some nice bits and bobs even the original retailers fender booklet with the serial number inscribed in it a few other bits and bobs and i think he liked the completeness of this as a package and i found old paperwork in his house which showed he had been on the hunt for a good strap for some time you know okay. uh, and this was obviously the kind of one of the ones that he he plumped for plays very very nicely actually and um, is a very i think very nice clean clean looking example. On the other end of the scale with the Strats, yeah. we've got this 1960. Yeah. I like this more than the 64. I think we all do. Yeah, and I like it, of course, for the very simple reason that this is a great player's instrument. It's got all the wear and tear. This is what we want. This is, the, this is a fabulously played, gigged, 
beautiful 1960 and um, just epitomizes what people like about a, a nice worn in old fender. And I love it for that. Um, I don't really like to use that kind of expression relic condition, but I, you know, well gigs feels like a good expression to me. Um, and, you know, this guitar has seen a bit of life. I like the colorway on this as well. I like yeah. the style of the burst on this. And also clay dot markers, of course. In fact, actually, when I looked at this, the, it was kind of logged down as a 59. In fact, it's got a 60 serial number on it. But I suspect, well, I, I know, frankly, that it's got some 50, 59 components in yeah. it. Um, so kind of, you know, that transition between the two years, really, and then, then numbered as a, a 1960. I think this is a cool strap. If you, you're going to own a nice strap, good player, nice, well gigged one, this is probably the sort of one to own. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. My first experience with guitars of this caliber was, mm -hmm. oh, in 2001 or so, I met Robert Fripp and he, uh, of King Crimson. Oh, I love and, King Crimson. Oh my gosh, he's, he's incredible. <laughs> yeah. And I was a new luthier. Mm -hmm. I'd been doing it. I'd been trained in building Baroque Viola de Gamas and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But as, as guitars, I was not, you know, there. And uh, he, he pitched up one day with five guitar cases, including a 59 Strat. Right. And no, a 57 Strat. I'm mm -hmm. wrong. I think it was a 57. And a, uh, and a 59 Les Paul Custom. Right, okay. And he just dropped them and says, here, look after these. I'm going to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Panic. <laughs> it's funny. I've become kind of a bit more comfortable in a way, I suppose, yeah. uh, over the last couple of months, kind of dealing with all of these guitars um, and looking after them. Uh, cataloging them um, and you know that, that kind of familiarity with them now has made me more comfortable with yes. them um, so the 59 I kind of I'm not shaking when I pick it up anymore um, I'm kind of I'm a bit more used to it I'm still um, shaking uh, on camera right at the beginning I, mm. I just moved that tag up at the top yeah and that was my first touch and I'm still shaking from that about 20 <laughs> minutes ago so I'm just going to nonchalantly just reach into this cabinet and and pull out a 59 Les Paul. I'm looking for the SWAT team, to be honest. Let's go. Heavenly choirs sing. I've, I've held the single most complete Stradivari instrument in existence, you know, all original finish, etc., 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 and I'm no stranger to being behind the scenes in museums and the like. And this has that same feel. And it's not because it's pristine; it's because it's been used and it's had a life and it's been used for what it was supposed to be used. Nothing annoys me more. <sighs> than people that, that buy instruments like this and chuck them in a, in a vault. I sincerely hope this goes to a player. We don't have a neck rest, it's fine. All right. So obviously there's scars, there's bits and pieces, there's a, a, an extra hole down there. For some reason, that strap button has been moved, maybe out of personal preference. It's kind of one of those almost annoying scars, but again, part of its history. No attempt to fill it, it is what it is. If we look at other aspects, we can see that there's some, there's a refinishing on the sides and back of the guitar. Yeah, you spotted had, that around. Yeah, it's had what I would call a not altogether good refinish on it, but you know, again, honest. It's got that snake bite, as we talk about, from the Bigsby that was fitted to it. And of course, that's left those scars. Although we're not able to do it today, we have had the pickups out. They're absolutely right, spot on. They've got their black decals on the back. They're black wound inside, two solder blobs on each side, keeping them together and earthed all of this plastic as is original, but you can tell some of the screws have been replaced. So, you know, they're not all the original screws. Probably when stuff was being done, one dropped out on the workshop floor, another got replaced. Again, it's a player's instrument, mm -hmm. and uh, at least early on, it's like uh, cellos and viola de gambas. You used to get a beautiful old 
Viola de Gamba made in the 1700s and they lopped the neck off and turned it into a cello. Yeah, yeah. Which was done until the 70s, <laughs> which is when this guitar was uh, yeah. bought. And as we uh, talked about before, machine heads, much more reliable set of uh, machine heads have, have been put on it. The Les Paul has faded almost into oblivion there under the Gibson yeah. motif. There's just the slight remains of it there. If you hold it to the light, you can see. And it just has kind of those, those scars of playing. And you know, we've got photographs of James playing this in the 70s in black and white. You can see the same marks on it. You can see, you know, the authenticity of it that, that, that has kind of gone through those, those, those decades. So nice to have some good old photographs of James playing it in the 70s. And there's a classic one of him playing at the marquee as well. A color one, actually one of the rarer color ones uh, of him with this guitar. But you know, it did kind of pop up occasionally in the press. Um, you know, it's featured on the front cover of Making Music in the 1980s, a magazine. And it wasn't very specifically referred to. It was just used as a an example of a 59 in the article about 59s. So really in a way, it's pretty much undocumented, but, yeah. but it has a great provable history. So the, the serial number, 91865? 65, yeah. 65. And uh, that's going to be a number that's ingrained in me. Yeah. <laughs> that serial number is one away from Jeff Beck's. And you know, the, the legendary kind of stories that come up about guitars being cut from the same blocks of wood or whatever, yeah, you know, a lot of that is, <laughs> is myth. But you know, that adds it a little bit of cachet, I suppose, in a, in a really way. Does. Again, another hole just there where obviously a, a button has been on it. We have had the, the back plates off and um, it's all original. It's all original in there, yep. Interestingly, kind of, there is a little anomalous sort of wire, but if you work it out, there's a tiny pinhole. It was the earth for the Bigsby. Oh, of course. Yeah. I think that there's an honesty about this. It's, yes, I mean, I'm, well, you as an auctioneer, there's, there's an instrument like this, it's a player grade instrument that is still, mm. it has huge value intrinsically, but also, you know, emotionally and all of yeah, that jazz. Yeah we haven't found all of the other 59s that were made. Mm. Not not by a long shot. Sure. And yeah. I suppose at this point we're hoping that at least one or two of, will be found perfectly pristine, unblade under a bed. Yes, yeah, yeah. From from an auctioneer's point of view, fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it uh, doesn't feel the same. No, and I think the thing is, you know, when when you kind of effectively unearth something, this was hiding in plain sight, I suppose, this yeah. guitar. It's always been used, it's been played, it's had a lot of outings in its life, but really, in effect, it's undocumented, which kind of makes it fresh to everybody. And uh, that's part of the allure, isn't it? You know, there are 59s around that are for sale. People know about them, but people didn't know about this one. Yeah. And that's what's... That's what's nice about it. Yeah. This feels so naughty. <laughs> like, you don't just grab a random strap and plug in a 59, do you? Well, that's one of James's old straps as well. It knows the guitar well. Yeah. <laughs> go on, go for it. It's, I just don't, I don't have... <laughs> Kind of strange being kind of almost being at a loss isn't it in a way you know you kind of you know you can play it now play it <laughs> it shouldn't be elitist it shouldn't be only somebody who's an amazing musician should be allowed to play this thing but that's how i feel which is weird <laughs> strings wound over the um, tailpiece makes the feel the tension of the of the instrument and do you know why it was strung like that it was a very personal thing james being a bass player basically 
used to go for it quite heavily. Mm -hmm. um, so Graham strung it like that so that he'd break the strings less, set it there's, up. Yeah. There's less tension of feelings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why it's set up for James like that. Yeah. Oh, it feels great. It doesn't feel like a Strat. It, it doesn't quite feel like it is full, but... I mean, it sounds delicious. No, <laughs> you're doing fine. <laughs> this is, this is, it's an incredible guitar. It feels amazing. And, uh, you know, I do understand why they are what they are. Uh, and it was interesting, the weight of it, of course, is kind of quite crucial um, in a way. And they can vary by an ounce or two. Yeah. Um, and that comes in about spot on eight pounds seven ounces okay. um, so that's a kind of a good, very good weight as well um, it's it's not an uncomfortable I've, I've built much heavier guitars in my yeah <laughs> sort of go through what the pickups are, etc. then people will start shouting a bit. But, uh... I want it! <laughs> All right. Um, Mark? Thank you very, very much for, for having us, for show, letting us, for letting me even touch this damn thing. No, it's uh, been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you about them, and um, yeah, no, it's great. Thank you. Thank you for coming. No, I'm try and keep me away next time. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to end this because I'm like a pig in in, in shit right now. I don't normally swear on the show. <laughs> Um, this has been incredibly fun and, uh, dare I say it, inspiring. Yeah. They did get many, 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 many things right back then and uh, yeah, it's all good. Click like, subscribe. So these guitars are all going up on auction at Dora and Rees, March the 16th at 10.30. This video should be out by then. Uh, <laughs> I found out about the auction a couple of days ago <laughs> and it's been, uh, yeah, very, very recently planned. So uh, we'll get some stuff out. But uh, yeah, Dora and Reese, check it out. And uh, as we said earlier, if you have a collection that you want to uh, divest yourself of, come here. Links in the description. That's a better outro. <laughs> Cheers. <Thank you. laughs> uh, <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> it's far too low, man. Far too cold for this.